The divine is incomplete without our unique voice and our unique instrument and our right, and I would dare say our obligation to play that instrument as clean, as pure, as loud, and as true as we possibly can. Welcome to Why Isn't Everyone Doing This? I'm Emily Fletcher, and I believe that bliss is your birthright. That's why I'm calling on my world-class network to uncover the most potent, spine-tingling, even taboo healing modalities, all so you can reclaim your bliss. Let's do this. Sweet friends, if you do not know Aubrey Marcus, I am so excited to introduce this man to you. He is playing such a big game. He is a dear friend and has been a huge supporter of me and Ziva over the years. And in this conversation, we talk about how meditation has changed him, about how meditation can be a practice of psychonautics, the deep exploration of your own psyche, the dangers of jumping in too far too fast with psychedelics, and the best place to start if you're interested in beginning that journey. We talk about the need for initiations in our society and how charging himself up with erotic aliveness has helped him to build his empire. So buckle up. This is a fascinating deep dive into all manner of human consciousness. And I'm so excited to hear what you think in the comments. All right, sweet friends. Today is a really, really special day. I want to welcome you back to why isn't everyone doing this? And today I have the deep honor and pleasure of getting to have precious time with someone who I consider a dear friend, someone who I admire immensely. He is the founder of On It, which is a globally disruptive brand helping athletes and high performers all around the world. He has a gym in Austin, Texas. He is the founder and the host or the creator and the host of the Aubrey Marcus podcast, which is a good thing because it'd be weird if someone else was the host of the <laughs> Aubrey Marcus podcast, which has over 50 million downloads and is really exploring things on the thin edge of the wedge of really pushing humanity and consciousness forward in very brave ways. And I will say the only podcast that I listen to regularly. He also has created a donation-based coaching organization called Fit for Service, which is filled with such beautiful people doing brave inner and external work, and has recently created an awesome transformational music festival called Arcadia which I got to do an activation at yeah. last year and whoa, it was like a life highlight. And as, as big as the stuff is that this man is doing externally in the world, the thing that I want to highlight and the thing that I want to celebrate you for is your outrageous generosity. I am so moved by the bigness and the, and the constancy of your generosity. You invited me onto your podcast in 2019. You did not know me. My first book was coming out. I was four months postpartum. I was exhausted and being on your podcast. And then you even did an Instagram live with me because we were like, oh, we're in the running for the New York Times. And both things really moved the needle in, in me bringing my message to the world. You then saw things in me before I even saw them in myself and invited me to come and work very intimately with you and your wife. Uh, you invited me to speak at Fit for Service and at Arcadia, which was truly like one of the most cohesive, love-filled, exciting activations I've ever had on a stage. And then invited me with such generosity to stay in your home. And I'm and now being here today, like truly from the depths of my heart, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, you're welcome, sis. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of those are the easiest things to do when you're actually listening to the wisdom of the heart. The heart will tell you like what to do and you have to sometimes filter that wisdom through the the eyes of discernment and, the, and you know discretion because the heart might want to just give everything to everybody all the time and then you don't have sufficient resources but i just feel very blessed that i can hear the voice of my heart very clearly and also see and have the faith and discernment to understand like what is possible and that's the way i'd live my life and there's never been easier choices than all of those things that you mentioned because i just love everything that you stand for as a being in your being more than anything that you're putting out it's just who you are mm. and so let's go <laughs> let's go so this is actually beautiful because i want to i want to hear more about like did you hone that skill to be able to listen to the wisdom of your heart or has it always been there and that's very much what we wanted to talk about today of like why isn't everyone exploring within, you know, mm -hmm. in, the, in this day and age where everyone's a life coach and everyone thankfully is starting therapy and, you know, we were looking to these external sources. So one of the things you wanted to explore is why isn't everyone you know, exploring within? And I imagine that that is very similar to your ability to listen to the wisdom of your heart. Right. So is that something you've always had or something that you've cultivated? It's evolutionary, of course. I think there were 
threads of it, sparks of this thing that would ultimately become the bonfire of who I am that I could trace back to the early days. But it was the start of my plant medicine journey. When I was 18, just graduated high school, my father set me up with a shaman to go to the mountains in New Mexico. Wait, can we just underline that your father set you up yeah. with a shaman? Had he been doing He'd plant been medicine doing that work? work. So okay. he was he was connected to Stan Groff, one of the legends mm-hmm. in the uh, you know psychonautics world, both for his breath work and his work with psychedelic medicines. And Stan Groff had a kind of a crew that kind of was working with my father, both doing breath work and using psychedelic medicine. So one of the shamans in that cadre, you know, she was available to see me as a rite of passage, as an initiation, just coming out of high school. And coming out of high school, I had no spiritual beliefs at all. Actually, I had the antithesis of spiritual beliefs. You're atheist, yeah. Aggressively. <laughs> Aggre- a lot well, of atheists are because, because, <laughs> because all that I'd heard about from God was religion god doctrine dogma. and fear and shame and guilt and i was like this is bullshit and then i went on a family trip on my mother's side i went on a family trip and i saw the dungeons of the inquisition in italy and all of these torture devices and the most sickening part of it i would say 75 to 80 percent of the torture devices involved people's genitals Oof. right and i was like what the fuck and so with that, I was like, this is such bullshit. It's perpetrated it's such evil. Like, Bob, I got really kind of fired up yeah. reading my Christopher Hitchens. And I was like, let's go. <laughs> We're going to tear down organized yeah, religion. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. I was like, this is, this is the way. So my dad was like, great, great, great. <laughs> Why don't you go have this journey? Why don't out? you go ahead and find God <laughs> yeah, another yeah. way, son? <laughs> and I was like, you know, I was into it. You know, I really respected my dad and I was very curious. My Even everybody in my family instilled this thirst for knowledge like how much can we know how much can we learn and this i knew this was a way that i would get to learn but i was also terrified so i remember before we were actually gonna you know sit with the medicine which was a combination of mdma and psilocybin that was my first experience and i grabbed a rock from the from like out there in it was a river rock and it was very smooth and i was like as long as i hold this rock i'll know i'll still be here you know i was like (laughs) fucking terrified and uh went into the ceremony and i felt my body evaporate and my even my breath slow to a point where i was no longer conscious of my breath and all that remained was consciousness but really the best word i had for it at that point was like oh, this is my soul. Mm. And then I was like, well, if there's a soul, maybe this religion thing didn't have it all wrong. (laughs) And so that started the path of like, actually, I got to find, you know, my mind was like, no, none of this God stuff makes sense, none of that. But inside myself, when I went in, the interoception of going in with the medicine, then I was able to find that, oh, there's spirit, there's consciousness, there's a soul that lives in as me and through me. And so that was the first time where I started to really learn about myself and understand that I could shift my perspective to see my own actions, to see who I actually am. And it's been 24 years I've been on that journey. Whoa. And so how do you know like, that you want to explore with another medicine? Does the medicine call you? Does an opportunity arise? Or how does that work? There was a period where I was like just radically into psychonautics, exploring for exploring sake. Mm-hmm. So if there was something new and there was something novel and I hadn't done it, I was like, that's for me. And I think that was really valuable. You know, it wasn't that I was called to the this particular, I was called to all the medicines because I wanted to know yeah. what they were capable of and what they were doing. So like a chef has to try all the ingredients. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Like what, it, what are all of these things? How do they work? And that was a big driver for me, I think, early was to just experience all of the things from the lineages that carried that wisdom tradition and the medicine. So if I was going to do a boga, I went with the Bwiti shaman. If I was going to do ayahuasca, I went with the uh, Quechua shaman. I, there was, how did you get access to these people? Because, I mean, I've, yeah. there's access to medicines now more and more, but not so much access to, like, the people that have been holding the traditions. Right. <laughs> I mean, there wasn't the demand that there is now Mm -hmm. and there wasn't there weren't that many options but i had enough good roots in the community 
you know, that I was able to kind of suss it out and also use my intuition and also get lucky. And sometimes, you know, I didn't pick the right person. You know, it wasn't like I had a hundred percent track record of like, yeah. that's the right person. But I feel very blessed that, you know, holistically, um, whether I sought them out myself, was found them on accident or was guided to them. I've had some amazing teachers. I was just, my first ayahuasca experience, my first and only ayahuasca journey was in a a McMansion in Tampa, Florida. Uh-huh. <laughs> so it was uh-huh. like the Real Housewives do ayahuasca edition, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> which I always imagined I would be in Peru. And so, um, so I just think there's something to that of like connecting to the the tradition keepers of yeah, the. If medicine. you're going to visit this venerated sage, this wisdom keeper, if you're going to visit the grandmother, go go to her house. Yeah. Don't make her come to you. Like <laughs> go to her house. <laughs> Go see mama at her house. Yeah. Like that's that. Uh, there's something respect. to paying respect for that. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, my all of my first journeys were in Peru. I usually do most of my journeys now in Costa Rica, but I've done them here stateside subsequently, and it can be incredibly beautiful. It's not like it requires that, but there's something very beautiful about making a house call. Yeah. And so, and actually it feels like a bit more of an initiation and that's something, even though I'm a, a person who identifies as female, for years, I read this book called Of Water and the Spirit. Have you ever heard of this book? No. It was written by this uh, amazing man in Africa. He grew up in a pretty small tribe and he was kidnapped um, by French Catholic missionaries and taken thousands of miles away from his family and his home. And he was taught French and Catholicism and English. And at about 17 years old, testosterone's kicking in and he mm-hmm. was like, this is not it. Pushes his priest out of a three-story window jumps out after him and then runs, just starts running and finds his way back to his tribe in Africa, like some internal compass. He's now almost 18, but they're treating him like a child because he didn't go through his initiation ceremony. In their eyes, he had not become a man. And the gift that he's given us is that he then got to write about these amazing initiation ceremonies, like jumping through fire, meditating in front of a tree for 10 days, killing a lion with his bare hands, like these rites of passage. And Mm -hmm. I don't think that we would have had the same window in if someone had experienced it and then learned English, right? And so like, and, and ever since I've read that, it feels like we don't have that anymore. We don't have those initiations or rites of passage anymore. And I think that our society would be different if we did because then there's no proving. I don't have to prove that I'm a man. I don't have to use my power to sublimate the feminine because I've already proved it. Mm-hmm. So I'm just curious, like, did that feel like an initiation for Absolutely. you? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, every one of these things is an initiation. And I think it's a, it's a tragedy that it's not a formalized initiation. Yeah. So one of my favorite books of all time is Aldous Huxley's book called Island. And in the book Island, he sets up a utopian society that lives on an island called Pala. And it's all of Aldous Huxley's, who's a pioneering psychonaut, one of the most incredible minds of, you know, the 19th, the 20th century. With psychedelics? Yeah, with psychedelics. He (laughs) particularly liked mescaline, but he was, you know, into a variety of different things. He wrote the book, The Doors of Perception, talking about the psychedelic experience, intuited that basically the brain was like a radio receiver and actually what was normally happening, which now we call the default mode network, was actually filtering out all of the information and then psychedelic medicine was opening the blinds to allow us to actually perceive more. It wasn't implanting anything, it was just like opening the windows, like what's out, what else is out here? Mm. Which is still to this day, like the dominant theory about what's happening with psychedelic medicine is you're just tuning in to the field of what's possible instead of having the cognitive limiting device of your brain and your default mode network controlling things. So he writes this book, and the book's called Island, and it's a fictional story. And in this fictional story, the kids all go through an initiation, and the initiation is a difficult rock climb up a mountain to a cave where the elders of this initiation lineage would serve them in the story. It's called Moksha, which is med- which is the medicine. It's mm. the psychedelic medicine. So they'd go into this cave, and they have idols of archetypal representations of the divine divine feminine divine masculine you go into the cave after climbing this strenuous climb and you do medicine and that was one of the initiation rituals and it was formalized in this fictional culture and i think that's something we're deeply missing because we can find an initiation by going out and doing these medicines like i did and it works you know like the the initiations have happened but there was never a formal moment 
where it was like, this is your initiation. Yeah. And then all of the right words and all of the right ceremony. Or the preparation or, or the, the prepara- integration. Exactly, exactly. Or the acknowledgement from the people around you. Yep. Right? So this initiation topic, I think, really has the power to be quite transformative in our society. Like, do you see, there, there's football, for women who give birth or people who give birth, like childbirth is an initiation that's pretty common. Yeah, but is it treated like an initiation or nope. is it treated like a medical procedure? And like a sickness. Yep. And yeah, and we don't and that's have... The, and that's the thing. Like that is such a beautiful golden opportunity to make an unbelievable ritual out of one of the most sacred, if not the most sacred thing that ever happens. All right, let's make it that sacred actually and make a real ritual out of it. But of course... We are actually making a ritual out of it, but it's one of the dark rituals, the ritual of empire, the ritual of big pharma, the ritual of big medicine, the ritual of commodification of the self for money, all of these other rituals. We're actually worshiping the scientism and the kind of forces of empire by how we're doing it in our unconscious way. But let's, you know, really it's an invitation to like take back control. Even if you do birth in a hospital, you can still make it a ceremony mm-hmm. you can still make it a ritual mm-hmm. and i think this idea of like create your own rituals create your own ceremonies create your own initiation that radical permission that's something that i really stand for as well yeah i i did my best i had a four-day labor so i had plenty of time but i had signs on the door that i was like please only come in if it is absolutely necessary right. i had electric candles in there i had incense going and I had this one nurse who I loved and then she went off duty because, you know, four days and the new one came in and she was just like a fucking elephant in a china shop and she was just banging stuff and so loud. And I was like, ma'am, I am going to need you <laughs> to dial it down. And yeah. I was in this like ferocious yeah, mother yeah. mode, you know, I'm uh-huh. like, I am protecting this space. Um, but it's it, it just it can be such a beautiful, reverent, sacred time and we don't treat it as such. But do you have any ideas for ways that we could insert some sort of an initiation, some sort of rite of passage specifically for people who identify as male? Oh, so many ideas. And I don't think you get it all in one shot necessarily Mm -hmm. either. I think it's good to have big moments, but it's also good to have many different moments. Mm -hmm. And there's many different rituals that you can go. So I imagine my future son, who actually I'm intending to name Huxley and Vailana's on board as an homage to Aldous Huxley, who wrote one of my favorite books, Island, that it really changed the structure of my consciousness because it showed me the way that a society could be before Charles Eisenstein wrote his book, you know, 60 years before he wrote his book, The More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know as Possible, 70 years, whatever. Aldous Huxley wrote Island and it showed a picture, a snapshot of that more beautiful world and how it could look through his own vision and through his own eyes. Beautiful things in in which they even trained the parrots to say, attention. Mm. So all the wild parrots in the land of Pala said, attention. So when they were out there, instead of just parroting other random words, they were all trained to say attention. So all of them. Here now. Here And that was the other thing they would say. Here now? Yeah, yeah. Come on. Yeah. And so like... (laughs) So the birds would actually be be squawking that in this in this magical. So many beautiful ideas okay. that were shared. So our son Huxley, and I just imagine all of the different rituals. So okay, let me go through some of them. I think you know for a while when he's when he's a kid, you know I believe that like well sourced meat is actually really important for the fortitude of like our bodies. Like our bodies are meant to actually absorb that. Not meant to, but they can absorb that in a really powerful way. But of course, the energetics of how the animal was harvested, where it comes from, that's all very important. But I see a period where it's like, all right, now, son, you're at the point where you can hunt and actually the point where you can take this animal's life. And so I see restricting all meat, fish, everything, restricting all meat in that period and say, you know, now, son, if you want to go earn the right to actually eat these animals now, now you have to go through the whole process. You have to take the life, you have to clean the animal, and then you're have. Then you gonna be a part of cooking it, and then you'll be a part of eating it, and that will unlock for you this potential so that now you can eat whatever you want. Mm. You know, and same with growing food, right? Like Because same like, he'll have the reverence for it, because exactly. he'll know the energetic investment that it took know what, what we're it doing is. now, which is just consuming with no regard to the amount of energy right. that we're consuming. When I went hunting for the first time, you know, you have this cut of meat called a tenderloin. Ah, tenderloin, delicious, moist, 
you know, soft meat. Why? Why is it the tenderloin? Why is that meat softer? Well, I learned when I was cleaning the animal that I'd taken from the field, which is an unbelievably spiritually powerful process, you know, and I could tell that full story. But the most important part of this is that in the process of taking that animal's life, putting my hand on it, saying a prayer, putting my knife in its heart after it was a clean shot with the rifle at like, it, it was a really beautiful experience. Four days looking for the right animal. I'll just tell a little bit of this story. This black buck doe comes in it about 260 yards away, runs towards me. This is after four, I thought I wasn't going to get an animal. Runs towards me, turns broadside and presents. It's like the perfect shot. And I was like, oh, you're the one. I just knew it. I was like, oh, you're the one. Took the shot, deep breath. <sighs> Took the shot, clean shot. One gallop and then it falls. And then intuitively, I just started running towards it because I didn't want it to suffer and I wanted to be there. And I put my hand on its head and I saw that when I put my hand on its head that porcupine quills had gone through its cheek and was actually piercing into its eye. So this animal was in constant, constant pain. And I could see the inner secret wisdom of the universe, of the goddess that said, that animal knew that if it just ran this way towards me and presented itself, I would be able to not only have my own initiation, but end its suffering. Like it, the quill was in its eye before you shot it. Yes. Oh. Yes. It was, it'd been living with that the oh. whole time. So this unbelievably powerful moment, I found the soft spot between the ribs. I could feel the heart still beating fast. And I just plunged my knife into its heart and said a prayer and just started weeping, oh. weeping. And then we carried the animal back and then strung it up, skinned it. That skin is still on my altar. And then when we were quartering it and then preparing the meat, it was like, okay, here's the tenderloin. Well, the tenderloin was on the inner thigh of the animal. Now you imagine an animal, it's all haunches, all of the movement, the big powerful movement, the jumping, the galloping, it all comes from the posterior. The interior is that's for like change of direction, cutting and actually moving the legs closer together. But they, that doesn't happen that often in the wild. It's important they have that muscle, of course. They need to be able to close their legs if they want to. <laughs> but they don't use it that often. So it's not tough. It's not strong. So you could feel the different textures of the muscles mm. and understand this isn't just tender meat. This is this muscle from this animal. And that changed the way that I look at food mm. fundamentally. Mm. This feels like an important initiation. Thank you for that. Yeah. And that's, I mean, it, that's just, you know, one of them. Mm -hmm. There's like, there's many different, yeah. many different initiations. And mm -hmm. I'd, I'd happily talk about some of the other ones that are mm -hmm. kind of planned for Huxley as well. I love that you're already planning for your son. Um, I'm curious because I know that, that plant medicine and psychedelics has been such a big part in many initiations sure. over time. And so what would you say to someone who has never done any sort of psychedelic, any sort of plant medicine that this heals for and that maybe they've grown up with conditioning that's like that is devil work, that is you're going to lose control, we don't know who's going to come in when you open yourself up in that way. Like what would you say to someone that's just starting or curious or even scared? Mm. I always recommend that you start with breath. Because if you take breath and you take it to actually its full potential into the shamanic breath work, which is beyond even like the Wim Hof breathing, which is more about the physiological effects, although you can enter altered states of consciousness. But to take that shamanic breath work ride where you actually go to the point where your consciousness starts to dissolve very much like my medicine journey. And then the somatic experience of all of that trauma starting to shake out of your body, all the tears that are uncried, all the grief that you haven't wailed into the into the sky and into the earth, all of the rage that you haven't expressed, all of that that comes through. That's a great place to start because it gives you access to altered states of consciousness. But guess what? If you want the experience to stop, just slow your breathing down. Yeah. Like you can take your foot off the gas anytime you want. Mm -hmm. And so getting used to that first is always the place to start. And then from there, maybe you go into a sweat lodge, mm -hmm. you know, where the door of the Anipi or the Temescal closes and there's just heat and smoke and prayer and, and darkness and be there with that and that's a psychedelic experience you know like really what i'm a proponent for is not necessarily psychedelics but psychonautics mm, what's the, the difference psychedelics are the medicines that you take and some of the medicines aren't even technically psychedelics heart medicine is not a psychedelic k2 
ketamine is not mm-hmm. a psychedelic. Mm-hmm. There's not class. I mean, we call all of these things psychedelics, but it's not actually even accurate. Psychonautics is about exploring, like astronauts. They explore the you know the astral. Well, not the astral in the spiritual sense, but the world of stars and the universe. Psychonauts explore the world of the psyche. You know, so they actually go in and explore what's inside. And that's the thing, like, why isn't everybody doing it? It doesn't require that you take any exogenous substances or medicines. Meditation is a practice of psychonautics. Mm. It's actually learning about something that's inside yourself. Mm -hmm. So that's the first place to start. And then also fundamental superstructure, you know, changes about how you understand the cosmos, you know, to really understand and I say this quote a lot, but it's Rumi's quote, that you're not a drop in the ocean, you're the ocean in a drop. So everything that you might perceive, oh, these energies are going to come in, those energies are already in, baby. They're already in you. Yeah. All of them are in you. So if you're worried about it, it's just an act, it's just a matter of resonance. It means that you're resonating with that. And then get curious, why am I resonating with this dark energy? What fear do I have in myself? So when I see someone going through a process in breath work or in a medicine journey or something where something actually literally looks demonic that comes out my the way that my superstructure is from my own 24 years of journeying and understanding the world of polarity and i recognize that as just an unintegrated part of the darkness or the shadow self that someone has so instead of saying we need to cast this out which then just further deepens the darkest cut of the shadow it's you know, welcome back to the garden. Like Mm. you're welcome here. Mm. You're welcome here. Mm. And so with that, there's just no fear. Like there's so much fear. And to start to soften the edges of that fear. And again, this kind of Judeo-Christian Catholic perspective about this is good, this is bad, all of these kind of ideas of strict polarity and duality to understand that we're all the good and we're all the bad. We're the place where the demon and the Buddha meet. And that's the truth of it. And so to see that, and then you can step into a place where you no longer carry that fear and then get more courageous with the practices that you do, even up to doing a medicine like ayahuasca, which is going to take you on a five to eight hour ride, you know, that's, you're not really in control of at all. And you have to be willing to just let go of the reins. And that's a terrifying thing, except if you trust that what you're letting go of the reins to is got you, mama's got you, mama's got you. Your trust falling into the open bosom of the universe, you know, where Father, you know, Father God, Father Shiva is going to hold you. And if you're asking for forgiveness, that Father God energy is going to say, forgive what, my <laughs> child? I don't see any grievance. I, I hold no record of wrong. And then the mother that says, come here, sweetheart. You're a little sick. Let's purge this. Come here. I got you, baby. I know this is hard, but you're going to have to look at it. You're going to have to see it. You're going to have to move it. And to just know that you're falling into the lap and into the arms of something that's really got your back. Mm. However, it's not to say that you should jump headlong into that if you're not ready, if you haven't done the breath work, if you haven't been kind of fully preparing yourself, because it can be destabilizing. You know, if you go, you go blasting right through the thing about an ayahuasca journey, you can't take your foot off the gas. And if you're in a space, you can get stuck in a really challenging loop in a trauma circle in a place where you've lost your active agency, where you can even tell yourself to surrender because you can't even summon that agency. So you're stuck in a place of resistance against some energies that are really hard and it can be very re-traumatizing or immensely destabilizing. And that's on the negative side. It can also be destabilizing on the manic side. If you have unresolved issues and ideas, delusions of your own grandeur and egotism that hasn't been acknowledged, like where you pretend that you have no ego and then all of a sudden the medicine comes in and some thought it's over expressing that is like, I am not only tapping into the energy of the Christ, I'm Jesus. I can't tell you how bummed I get when I meet people who are like, I'm Jesus. I'm like, no, bro. <laughs> No, like we're all the Christ, <laughs> but like oh. <laughs> it's, you're not the guy. I had somebody, I had somebody at Arcadia, and he was like, you know, I just want to tell you, man, like I'm the guy, and I'm like, what guy? It's like you know, you know, the guy, and I'm like, what guy is that? And he's like, you know, the guy. I was like Jesus, and he's like, yeah. It's like, oh God, here what, we go. And what do you say to that? Like, were you just like seeing like? Enjoy? No, I mean, at that point, I looked him very clearly, and I said, listen, brother. 
All of us, all of us are the Christ, and that is the message of the Christ. And nobody can claim to be the Jesus because that is one man, and that one man, you know, that one man is not us. And that was know. his version of the divine, and you are your own version of the right, divine. Right, exactly. Mm-hmm. So we can participate in that Christ energy, that Christ consciousness, but we're not the guy. And I think it's also a slippery slope that a lot of people get in with a lot of psychics and in mediums and I can't tell you how many psychics and mediums tell people that they're the this fucking former past life emperor or king. There can't be that many fucking emperors or kings in everybody's <laughs> fucking lineage, you know? Not who, was every- the, who are the paupers? Yeah, yeah, Who was exactly. cleaning the toilets exactly, and the latrines? Exactly, you know, it's like, and it's all of this is like a seductive allurement for the, for the ego. And so I'm very cautious with all of those things. And at the same time, sometimes amazingly powerful things come through that you're like how on earth am i this blessed i had this experience recently i did a medicine journey and the medicine that i'm most drawn to right now is the combination of ketamine and cannabis and it's been incredibly powerful for me over these past few years and of course ketamine's been legalized for the treatment of depression cannabis has been legalized in most of the states so interestingly it's fully legal to do this my ketamine's prescribed by a doctor my cannabis is legally acquired. Cool. I mean, it's not that I'm opposed to acquiring things from other ways. <laughs> Obviously, I couldn't have been a psychonaut for 24 Just years doing nice things completely by the in book. The open. <laughs> but in this particular journey, I felt so much blessing coming through me. I felt all my allies and guides, and I have some odd and peculiar allies and guides. The energy of Mercury, the Roman, the Roman god Mercury, also known as Hermes in Greek is one of my allies and he brings energy through my feet and through my ankles, like the wings that were depicted on the ankles. I was like, I get it because this energy floods through my body. My legs start tingling and I feel this unbelievable life force coursing through my body. And I know that that's the energy. So still, thank you, thank you. Like, thank you. So it was not only that, but it was countless other energies and beings and the divine life force itself pouring through me. And I just was overwhelmed at that point. And this is, I mean, again, lots of experience with this. I still, I go, man, why me? And I just hear the voice of the divine go, well, why not you? (laughs) And I was like, yeah, why not me? Why not me? You have an abundance of divine energy. Why would I be even a little bit hesitant to receive the fullness of that energy through me? And why would I think that you would be like, yeah, buddy, I'm going to give you a little bit, but that's all you get. Yeah, you better be grateful. You for better what be I gave grateful you. for what I gave and you. You also were taking away some of that from your brother. Yeah, so exactly. you better enjoy it. All of these stories of finitude and scarcity, mm-hmm. and just and it was just like a very sweet little moment where it was so overwhelming that that was my response. Why and not then you? why not you? Oh, this is so beautiful because one of the things I wanted to talk to you about because you're playing such a big game, mm-hmm. and I know that you're really just getting started. Yeah. And I remember actually at at Arcadia, we were backstage, which we're not backstage, but like in the audience. Mm -hmm. And I was watching you watch the stage of this beautiful first of its kind festival where it felt like like you created Burning Man, like a a flavor of Burning Man. But but there was even like seeds of something bigger Mm -hmm. there in it. And also, not that many people know, or maybe they do, I don't know, you were supposed to have that in Wyoming until like Mm -hmm. two to three weeks prior, and you moved it all, like so much money out of your own pocket, but we're here, we're in it, we're like in the magic. And I, for whatever reason, like, and this is obviously my interpretation of your experience, so you can validate or deny. Um, I imagine it's quite accurate. (laughs) But it's as if I could see the grid, like above and below you. And for the first time, I was able to sort of sense the magnitude and the grandeur of just how big the game is that you are playing. Mm. And it's very exciting to me. (laughs) It's very exciting to me. Because I know about, I know the purity of your devotion, like your devotion Mm. to the divine, specifically your devotion to the goddess, which is not necessarily be mean female um but i'm curious what you would say to people who are afraid of their own power people who you know have some tall poppy syndrome or think that if i really step up that i'm going to lose my friends or that people will be jealous of me or who am i to step into this like can you speak to someone who's who wants to and knows that they can but isn't yet fully inhabiting like all that they are this is where death can be a wise advisor 
a really wise advisor because imagine, imagine now project yourself if you feel any of that resonance with what you shared about, I don't know about me, I don't know about this. Imagine you're at your final, final stages on your deathbed. Imagine looking back at your life. Are you going to be like, ha, oh, good job, man. Or good job, good job, you know, girl, you, you, you really played it small. Like, thanks for that. I'm glad you really toned it down. Really kept it safe. Really kept it safe. Like, good work. Mm-hmm. We got one or two more months of yeah, yeah. mediocrity. You know, but and- you know what? And let's just keep it small all the way through. Uh-huh. Let's make sure you don't express anything too loud on this. No. You want your yeah. eulogy to be like, Aubrey yeah. Marcus <laughs> yeah. is safe and small. <laughs> yeah. Meek. Is that, really? Is that what you want? No. <laughs> and of course, people realize that. It's like, why didn't I let myself be more happy? Why didn't I... It's all of the things that we didn't allow ourselves to express. So in the proximity of death, death is truth. And in that truth, you can actually fast forward yourself to see like, okay, from my position of death, and maybe even beyond the deathbed, maybe in that place where you've left this body and you're looking back on this life you've lived as a collection in the whole array of the many lives you lived. And what do you want from that life? You want to be that man, I was Aubrey Marcus and I fucking, I screamed Aubrey Marcus. I let it pour out of every pore of my body, not to glorify the name, but because I am a unique self and without my instrument playing in the whole symphony, the divine is incomplete. The divine is incomplete without our unique voice and our unique instrument. And it's our right. And I would dare say our obligation to play that instrument as clean, as pure, as loud, and as true as we possibly can. I remember you said that to me in Miami. When we were doing our, our week long together with, with Vailana, your wife, mm-hmm. your amazing goddess. Oh, of a she's wife. the best. The best. <laughs> Actually, fun fact: when we reunited, I was invited to speak at, at your men's group in Austin, and I was doing a ceremony, and I was handing out flowers to all the men there, and I looked you right in the eyes, and I was like. Something that came through me was like, take me to your wife. <laughs> was like this, this being that was like yeah, knew that we yeah, needed yeah. to connect. Mm-hmm. Um, so thank you, whoever that was. Um, but you looked at me and you you just said, like, at what point are you gonna own your own mastery? Yeah. Like at, at what point, Emily? Like yeah. you have both a, um like an opportunity and an obligation, actually. Mm. And so, and then really I've I've kept that with me. Like if I if I start to shrink or play small or think, who am I? I'm just like it's really been a beautiful anchor. Yeah. So thank you for that. Of course. And and so going back a little bit, if we go back to the control and the, the darkness coming coming in and out. There was a Shakespeare quote that came to mind, which is that nothing is either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Mm. And so I think there's an analogy there, actually, people who might be afraid to do this inner exploration um, with psychedelics or just simply looking within and really... Mm-hmm integrating the darkness or the sticky stuff, the stuff we don't want to see. And um, and what we were talking about with the initiation of like, how do we love that part? How do we not exercise it or judge it as bad, mm-hmm. but really love it? So to me, it seems like if you're going through initiation or if you're surrendering control to something bigger than you and something gets exposed that you would have judged as bad or dark or something you don't like about yourself, can you maybe share how you found ways to love those pieces of yourself. It's a challenging journey because we have an idea of who we want to be, to be good, right? To be good. We have, we feel like every aspect of us needs to be good, but actually every aspect of us is every aspect of everything. And so to actually recognize that it's one thing to actually forgive you know, some kind of behavior, some kind of action, some kind of attribute in another person. I think that's level one. That's very hard to like have love for. I mean, the stories of Ram Dass had, you know, Donald Trump on his altar. That was because it was a hard person for Ram Dass to love. So mm-hmm. if he was going to be Ram Dass, he wanted to make sure that he could love Trump too. Otherwise he wasn't Ram Dass. So on the external, it's important to, you know, work with those energies and that's challenging enough. The even more challenging part is when you find and locate that within yourself. And then the question is, can you love that too? Mm -hmm. Can you love that too? Can you love that too? And it's it's a process that takes courage. And it also takes a different understanding about what it means to actually be good, right? It's like, I think Star Wars does a good job of depicting that 
every Jedi could become a Sith, like the dark force and the light side of the force. They're all available. <laughs> this is what I'm preaching to my son all the time because he's four and a half, right? And yeah. so it's like good guys, bad guys, good guys, bad guys. And every time I'm like, everyone has good and bad inside of them. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. all do good and bad things. And he's like, mom, shut up. Good guys, bad guys. Uh, I'm like, yeah. okay, this is just part of his evolution and I just have to relax. Right, right. <laughs> but it's it's like- Well, I'm, he's reading. He's reading the story of our, it's the story of our time. Mm -hmm. This is the old story. There's yeah. good and there's bad. And bad is outside. Good is inside. Mm -hmm. And and this is bad is the other, good is me. Mm -hmm. You define yourself based upon what's bad about the other, which makes what you are good. Mm -hmm. This is the division in polarity that we've experienced, particularly over the last three years. And it's all, but it's always been there. So he's actually accurately reading what the Toltecs would call the mitote, which is the collective consciousness. The mitote means marketplace. The marketplace, the ideas of the collective zeitgeist. He's reading that. And he's just expressing that because it's in all the stories and in all the cartoons and and all of that. But new stories, new myths, new consciousness needs to emerge that tells a different story. And it's not like we're inventing this for the first time. My Mahayana Buddhist mentor, a guy named John Churchill, I did a podcast with him. And he was the one who told me that when the Buddhists, the Tibetan Buddhists in his lineage are meditating, they're meditating on a tanka. And a tanka looks like an image of a demon. And his favorite tanka is a tanka named Yamantaka. And Yamantaka is the death fucker. <laughs> and death fucker has a raging erection. He's got like a, he's like a buffalo man. He's like this wild, wild beat. And what they're doing is they're evoking that energy, that the power of that dark, dark masculine energy. And they're bringing that, drawing that in and then, synthesizing that and transmuting that into their full life force energy and then that's where the buddha meets that energy but it's actually a process where they're they're meditating and actually identifying with those primal energies of that one that looks at death and says come here sweetheart i'm gonna fuck you open see how hard my cock is come closer right like that power and that's actually so that technology of recognizing that within yourself it takes some time and, and I've been tested in that to be shown all of the different dark nooks and crannies of myself and to not flinch and to not shy away and know I am all of that and what I choose to express is the nature of who I actually am. It's not because I'm fundamentally good or bad, it's my choice and I get to choose to be what I want to be and you know it's very difficult to actually choose to be a Sith because you have to keep a wall of delusion up that the delusion being that you are not me living a different life, right? Like you mm -hmm. have to justify or degrade or dehumanize the other. Someone actually, else that you're hurting. Someone else that you're hurting. Mm -hmm. you, you have to, to play that game. So it's actually a little bit more difficult to play that side, mm -hmm. you know, but that's why I think good always wins, right? Because it doesn't require delusion because it, because it's grounded in truth. So all of those stories like, you know, good always wins in the end. I think that mantra is actually accurate because it has an inherent advantage in the long run is that it's grounded in truth. It's grounded in the idea that we are all of the same source wellspring of life itself. But for me, just understanding that my choice to express how I want to express is enough. And it's not because I'm not bad. You know, it's because I'm choosing to act in this way, bound by the values and truth and the love that I actually feel. Well, it feels like that's... That's the thing, that the love can transmute the fear. The love can consume the darkness, but the darkness can't fully consume the love. No, that's right. And and so it's... That's right. Yeah, it's just which there's the, the It's actually, there's an inherent advantage to mm -hmm. good because love is the is the substrate. It's Eros, mm -hmm. it's Shekinah, it's the force. So, so speaking of Eros, which I'd love for you to define mm -hmm. for us, but we've been talking a lot on this just because this is the thing that I'm really stoked about these days is sacred sexuality, transmuting your, your creation energy, this erotic energy that's alive inside of all of us, and then using it to fuel the life you really want to live. And then what's really exciting to me is creating a huge collective antenna and a lot of people birthing this new earth that our hearts know is possible, mm -hmm. right? What Charles wrote about in his book. And most of my guests on the show so far have been people who identify as women. And, and so there's a lot of the divine feminine talk. And so I would love for you to share like how you, someone who identifies as male, 
one, work with sacred sexuality, transmute sexual energy into creating things in your world. And then two, and this is probably a bigger question, like live such a life of devotion to the divine feminine, to goddess energy. It's the same question. Great. I mean, fundamentally, eros and ethics are inseparable. And how would you define each? So eros is the force of life, allurement, presence, attraction, and also in some cases, repul- it's all it's almost the magnetism of the entire cosmos. The magnetism of the cosmos. Yeah. yeah. And it was actually, so it was symbolized in the two cherubs that were intertwisted at the top of the Temple of Solomon, who carried this lineage transmission of Eros and connecting it to Shekinah. And who's Shekinah? Shekinah is the is kind of Eros embodied as a goddess, right? So it's the force of Eros. It's a simple way to say it, but there's many ways that you could describe Shekinah. She's often called the bride, but that doesn't quite fit. That's more in the Malchut kind of. It, there's, a, there's a variety of different ways to describe it, but as and Rabbi... Embodiment as, is of Eros. Yeah, mm-hmm. in, a, in a way, but it's so, it's so ever-present in every man and every woman and every you know, bite of food and everything. It was actually really the symbol was created as the two cherubs on top of the Ark of the Covenant and on top of the temple in Jerusalem. And Shekinah wasn't either one of the cherubs. It was the space between. Mm-hmm. It was the thing that drew them together to intertwine and get into that dance. So the third that, thing that is created exactly. when the energies and the polarities merge. Exactly. And that's Eros. And, you know, again, as Rabbi Mark Gaffney shares, like the sexual models the erotic but does not exhaust it. So mm-hmm. we think of erotic and we think of sex. And yes, sex can and should be erotic. And also, it's just a model for living your life erotically, like Rumi, the poet, who is constantly talking about the great beloved. And you imagine that that great beloved was a man or a woman or whoever he was attracted to, when in reality, the great beloved was his love affair with God, Mm. you know, and or Shekinah or whatever the name is that you want to say, but it was his love affair with life. Yeah, like what you seek is seeking you, right? Mm -hmm. That's that magnetism. If you have the desire, then it has the desire for you as well. Yep. And so how do you like if you if you feel comfortable sharing, like personally use that eros, that energy to or do you use that to create what you're creating in the world? <sighs> so go back to younger Aubrey mm-hmm. and my desire, my craving for the goddess was so strong that I recognized that okay and i remember i remember one very defining moment and again this is young aubrey i actually went by the name chris then because i had two middle names chris and aubrey were my middle names people called me chris i switched that to aubrey but that's a bracket not important but anyways so young <laughs> chris marcus fake id 20 years old i go to a burlesque show in vegas called la femme and it was based on the burlesque show in paris the famous one at the crazy horse gorgeous like abs like the way that they play with lights and music and the dancers it was stunning and i remember i had the crown royal on the rocks and i was again fake id and uh, i'm just sipping that and i'm a 20 year old college kid right and these are like gorgeous professional dancers like women like the goddess embodied they were like shekinah embodied the allurement i was feeling was like through the roof right they were like expressing this element of femininity and sexuality that was so far beyond whatever I could cultivate and I was like man how on earth would I get a date with one of these women like how do I become a great enough man that they would say yes if I said hey you want to go out like a goddess of that kind of power of Vailana like how could I be the man that the Vailana would be like yeah and so I saw the world I looked at the world and I saw like all right what does the world show me what is the world teaching me well you need to have resources, you need to have personal power, you need to have a variety, you need to have a healthy, strong body, you need to have all of these things that are still a part of what I am. And but it was very much focused. So the eros the my desire to actually be and meet a goddess of that level. And again, I didn't talk to them. I don't know how they were in conversation or whatever. But <laughs> that's the energy the I felt the, yeah, the energy the I felt from them, the um, power. It's like, I will do whatever it takes to be the type of man that could be with one of those women, whatever it takes. And that was not limited to one thing. I didn't say, I just got to get the money. It wasn't like Scarface or I just got to get the power. It's like, 
holistically across the board, intellectually, my humor, my kindness, my love, my ferocity, my wealth, my influence, all of that needs to be in line. So that drew me forward in a fundamental way. And there's still aspects of that that draw me forward. I'm not going to say that that has left. It's been included and transcended. But the first pull of Eros was the pull to my greatness Mm -hmm. so that I could be a match for the goddess, which mm-hmm. I wanted so bad. Mm, so beautiful. Uh, that's a it's a really empowering reframe on something that we could, there's so many ways to shame that as yeah. lust or proving or you don't believe that you're enough. And so you have to, like, there's a million ways you could um, like warp that and you haven't, like you can see the purity in that. Yeah. And now I'm curious, you know, the work that Bailan and I were doing and this work of like actually transmuting sexual energy into manifestation, mm-hmm. the creation energy itself and manifesting with it. Is that a practice that you do actively? So the, the way that I see it now is I see that Eros is the reason why I even care. It's like it's, it's, it actually gets me still in a different way, not to care because I want to match with so I'm already matched with the goddess. I've succeeded that. And so I've included and transcended that. But when I'm charged with Eros, poetry falls from my lips. Mm. I can see things that I wouldn't normally see. I have more courage to take a stand. So the way that we use it in our relationship is, you know, she knows that if she fills me with Eros, she packs my body full of Eros, that I will go step forward as the king that I am and actually create good for us and for the world. Mm. And so it's really about like tapping into that place, filling me up, mm-hmm. and then allowing all of that to move through me. It's like charging charging my whole being, and then everything disseminates throughout, you know, throughout the whole kingdom. Mm. So that's really how it's done. And it's it's it doesn't require us to have, for me at least, like a particular practice of this or that when it's happening it's like just pack me full of it and trust that my body will be the vehicle and the channel that will take all of that energy and it'll pour through my body Mm -hmm. and and that will create beauty yeah, like she likes the vision that you're creating and so she's like fueling that like exactly using that to generate it um and so what would you say to people who identify as male and who are wanting to get into sacred sexuality or even like devotion to the divine feminine like how do you do that and still, because we've been so, you know, patriarchy is all around us and pussy is like the worst insult you could call someone. And there's, there's just swimming in this old paradigm. Mm. So how do you in this day, as the frequency of the planet seems to be changing into a more receptive, more leaned back, more magnetized, more harmonious frequency, how, what would you say to men who are starting this journey who want to devote to the divine feminine? I don't think you should try to force yourself to do it. I think you have to be allured. You have to be drawn towards it. So I would really focus on the genuine allurement to the goddess in whatever way that is for you, right? Mm -hmm. And pussy is an incredibly alluring force. For me, in my own sexuality, I am so drawn to that. The smell, the like every aspect of it transcends anything that you could look at from a materialist reductionist standpoint it's it is this it's this world it's a portal that consumes point yes it consumes me with ecstasy you know when i can smell it still on my face after a lovemaking session i'm still in heaven Mm -hmm. and i don't want to wash my face you Mm -hmm. know it's like i in that type of love for that aspect of the goddess and there's many aspects beautiful aspects of the goddess and I have a recent, you know, real sister that I made like a deep friendship with no sexual energy at all there. But there's so there's many different ways to relate to the goddess. And so I don't want to isolate it to this. But if you're talking about sacred sexuality, find that point that you're the most allured to. And maybe it maybe for you, it isn't that. And maybe feel free to explore that thing that you are most allured to rather than the mental constructs of I need to do this and let's get an orgasm, this line sexing consciousness where you're just thinking about an outcome, trying to create a result, worrying about your performance in your head, trying to figure all this shit out. Allow yourself to become completely intoxicated. Mm. Allow yourself to just swim and float in the garden of feminine ecstasy and just just 
let it consume you entirely. And then that's the place by which you can start, you know, some real reverence in, in for that aspect and expression of sexuality, and then extend that out to the entirety of the being. You know, a woman is not just a pussy. She is every aspect. She's her heart, her mind, her spirit. And yes, men and women share that same quality and, and all of the genders share that same quality. We all share that. So, but I think the starting point is like, what are you allured to? And what are you like, what, what is intoxicating for you really about the essence of another person? Hmm. So I love that. So don't force it because we think we should, but just like right. what is what is the actual magnetism, which is the eros, and right. if that regardless of gender or whatever, it's like where's that pull? Devote to that. Let yeah. yourself be surrendered by that sensation and consumed mm-hmm. by that sensation. So mm-hmm. we talked about why people. We talked about why people. Why aren't people exploring within? But like, why why aren't they? Like, why do you think we're so af- afraid of it? Why isn't there more of it? So the identity structure of who we are, people call that the ego. But the problem I have with with the word ego is there's a lot of conflation with the idea of ego with hubris and pride and and a lot of the different shadow aspects of ego. Right, like ego is bigger than right. just the Right, the negative. way that we use the word, yeah, it's, it's, it's your identity structure. It's your identity. It's who you are in identity. It's the thing that separates you from the complete homogenous you know wave of the divine like ego says i am but in saying i am it's also saying i am not i am this is my body it's mine and it's of course connected to all of the earth and contained of all of the particles of the mother yeah. and the water and the air of the course the wave is not an illusion it's an appearance of separate right it's not an illusion of right. separate so and that's the that's an important aspect the identity structure says well at least in some densities in some dimensional realities this is me and me is different than you and so it's very important because that's what allows us to explore and allows us to differentiate that's a that's a vehicle that allows us to really play so but the problem is is that the ego can then become an entity in and of itself and Mm -hmm. that entity cannot evolve very well unless it really the way that it evolves is much more like the phoenix it's much more like a caterpillar evolves into a butterfly which is it turns into goo and then it sprouts wings or it turns from a bird it goes to ash and then it gets its fire wings this is how the ego has to actually evolve it has to molt it's very difficult for the ego to change in micro ways it's very stuck and stubborn so when you look within you're threatening to kill this identity construct that you have so you're facing death so deepest compassion for those who are afraid to look within because if they see within and they see that yes i am this ego this identity construct but i'm also all that is i'm also the embodiment of eros i'm also connected to all things i also have a soul lineage where this is just one life in the advent calendar of who i really am you start to see that and then all of a sudden that identity complex that structure it has to die and so when you're asking somebody, why don't you look within? Why don't you change? You're saying, why don't you just die? <laughs> That's really what we're asking people. Why don't you just die? Well, this dying is scary. You have to face your biggest fear is going exactly. to your darkest pain. Exactly. The most embarrassing mm-hmm. and then dissolve and to go. <laughs> 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 yeah, and and that's and that's really what it feels like and people will defend their identity structure and they'll defend it as if they were defending their life because they're actually identified with it. So their 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 attentional system is fused yeah. to their identity and as it's fused their whole being is fused to that. So anything that challenges it is a threat. So this to me feels like why meditation is so important as like a precursor and as an integration tool to this work because every day, twice a day, then you are transcending the left brain and connecting to the right. You're transcending the the identity and connecting with the thing that lives beyond the death of the body. So if you're doing that in micro doses every single day, then when we do it in some initiation of a medicine ceremony or an actual facing of death or dissolving into a lover, like you're prepared at least to some degree, like you've practiced it, like you at least know that there is an ocean Mm -hmm. beyond just this Mm -hmm. wave. So I'm curious to know like what, what your meditation journey has been like. Like I know we 
danced in some parts of it, but I know your meditation journey is, is very vast. Yeah. So can you feel into like who you were before you started meditating versus who you are now and how that journey has changed you? So, you know, I was, there's a, I think there's kind of a, a school of thought and that school of thought is that if you reach these altered states of consciousness with anything other than meditation, you're cheating. And this is the only true and pure way. And if you're going to be like really a good person, this is, you don't need anything else. And, you know, like I'll have people, I'll comment about a medicine journey and just like, I hope that one day you realize that you don't need all that. I was like, yeah, I realize that. And also they're amazing. <laughs> I and need it. Have it's you, really fun. Yeah, for sure. Have you done it? <laughs> Like, it's awesome. I've been teaching meditation for like 13 years and I love drugs. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. So so I have I was given the gift of being able to use the bridge. I consider all of these medicines like a chakaruna, which is the Quechua word for bridge. And so it's a bridge to other states of consciousness. Meditation for me has been something that actually, you know, our meditations together, when I started to learn with you, that was one of the best experiences of actually having a practice that could drop me into really deep states of consciousness it drops me into that kind of void space yeah. you know where everything falls away and rest is happening and and of course you have all of these different talks that i'm sure everybody has heard but you, you get this kind of quantum rest mm. in that state quantum where everything rest. is just dissolved in this beautiful way and you're such a master at teaching that. And thank you for the personal attention and helping to illuminate that for me. The other practice that I've been working with that was taught to me by the Mahayana Buddhist, John Churchill, was to actually change and fuse my, and this is not separate necessarily from what you're doing, but it doesn't involve a mantra in exactly the same way, but putting my attentional system right on my heart. So all of my, all of my attentional system goes directly to my heart. And then there's primordial words for mother and one of the primordial words. So he's of Celtic Druidic lineage, mm. but he studied 30 years of Mahayana Buddhism. So the, the word that he prefers is awa. It's very similar to mama, mm. but it's awa, awa. awa. And so I identify, I feel the safety of the mother. I feel all around me and how safe she is and how she's holding me. And then I just go into this and I drop my attentional system right into my heart. And I'll just say, oh, and again, that becomes like a mantra, but it's not a mantra that's trying to actually drop you into the state where you step back and forget the mantra which is a beautiful practice. I love it. But it's actually to continue to feel your heart opening and connecting more to the mother. Mm -hmm. And so it's like driving, driving more energy through the heart that you're sourcing from Gaia. Mm. So I have now two tools that I really like and can mm -hmm. use for different occasions. One gives me this deep rest. The other really opens my heart and mm. makes me feel connected to the mother. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. I've never heard that. Awa, ah, well, stunning. Mm -hmm. and you can just feel like I yeah. feel like safe and enveloped. Yeah, exactly. Even hearing it. Um, something that I was taught is, is a, an advanced technique would be, you know, rather than putting your attention directly on the heart, that actually you can bring your attention to the to the rib cage, like the sternum right in front of it. And it's almost like the mm. gate to the heart. And it's like, it's like you said, if you're gonna go see the grandmother, like go to her house. Yeah. You know, it's so like if you want to go to the heart, like Go, maybe don't enter the house without her permission, but just go right outside. Yeah, yeah. And like, what if we bring our attention there and then let her expand, let uh -huh. her envelop you, which is also like the states of intimacy. Like if we, if we skip steps of intimacy right. and we're like, Hey, do you want to sleep together? And you're like, I, I'm, what is your name? You know, yeah, like yeah, it just, yeah, yeah. It, you have the opposite effect of attraction versus if, if we, you know, just gradually bit by bit deepen and then, and invite so that could be something to play with too. Of just like, like what it. if you put it right at right at the sternum? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like it. Good. I'd love to just before we start to wrap things up, I'd love to if you feel comfortable talking about the God bomb. Mm. If you feel comfortable talking about sure. that, okay, Let's great. Go. <laughs> Let's go. Um, so this is something that that you and Vailana cognize. Or like this feels like something that wants to come through a specific mm. medicine that wants to come through, and a beautiful activation and gift and experience that you facilitated for some of your nearest and dearest. This is 
again, my 24 years experience in many learning from many different ways, Vailana mm -hmm. naturally being a magical adept mm -hmm. and having this unbelievable ability to sing and play the sound bowls and download a direct transmission of someone's unique self and apply the sound to that. I was apprenticed in a particular type of body work from my brother Porangi and it's an unbelievable, you know, magical type of body work. So we pair both of those with the combination of ketamine and cannabis. And sometimes there's admixtures, but I'd prefer to allow those to remain in the mystery. But the core of it is the ketamine and the cannabis. And ketamine to me represents the dissolution of this identity construct and the opening to the fullness of all that is, right? It's like entering the void space. It's that Shivic, this is all of the cosmos that becomes available. Shiva being the destroyer of irrelevancy, right? Yeah. So you can just expand into all that is. All that is. Mm -hmm. And then the cannabis is the goddess. She's the one that awakens our senses. All the food tastes more sweet. The music sounds better. The body work feels better. The yoga feels better. Everything is in the body. This is the goddess. This is goddess medicine. So it's a combination of a very, very highly polarized divine masculine. So masculine, you wouldn't even call it grandfather. No one says grandfather ketamine. It's beyond that. It's beyond even the personality or archetype structure that could say grandfather, mother, brother, uncle. Yeah, it doesn't you know, want to be personified. No, it's not that. Mm -mm. And it's something else mixed with a very visceral feminine energy of the cannabis. And so in that combination, then stacking that with the body work and with the sound and it evokes like an unbelievable experience and we were honored to be able to offer that for you and to just see what came through and it's it's really stunning yeah i mean i can imagine it's so different for each person it is. But, but just to speak to my experience like one you have so many talents but i imagine people many people don't know that you actually are a very gifted body worker um but what what i saw when i was on the table was clear as day <laughs> Um, he's like pyramids and I could tell that they were both ancient and future like and and there was a group of us that were there in these ancient pyramids and in the future and and I could feel the transmission so clearly and I've always had a connection with with Egypt even in um, middle school I was in eighth mm. grade they asked me to teach the sixth graders ancient Egyptology and mm. I was like this seems unusual to ask a 13 year old to teach 11 year olds yeah, but now sure. I'm like oh right because I was there um <laughs> Um, but then cut to Burning Man and we're all in a pyramid together and you're introducing myself and Layla and Vailana mm. and Regina. And now like it's possible that we might be going to Egypt like in the fall with this amazing Egyptologist. And so it just feels really exciting to like have these very clear downloads that happen and then to see them yeah. come into, into fruition. And then the last thing I'll share about my experience, which again, I just felt so honored and grateful. Mm. Um, but that I was, Vailana started singing and it was something called called light language, which sounds like a language. You're like, oh, I just don't know what language that is. It must be right. like a mix of Portuguese and Czech or something right, right, that right. I've never heard. Yep. But it, but when she started singing, I felt like um, the deaf, sometimes you'll see videos of deaf children who get hearing aids for the first time and they get mm -hmm. to hear their mother's voice for the first time. And that is what it felt like for me that I was hearing my mother tongue for the first time. And then afterwards I said, what was that? What were you singing? What language is that? And she said, I don't know. I've never sung that before. It was mm -hmm. actually a weird tone for me because it wasn't my voice. It was your mm -hmm. voice. Like she was able to tune into whatever my light language code right. is. And it was just such a fascinating, beautiful experience. And I, I guess I just want to say like, thank you for receiving the download and thank you for gifting that to yeah. me. Well, it's absolutely our honor. And we've facilitated this now, you know, probably close to 30 times and different people. And again, it's very unscalable and mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's me and Vailana spending a full five, six hours with somebody, mm -hmm. you know, so this is not something we, that we can scale and it's our unique energy in medicine, but the, the reciprocity is built into it because in that space, we share, we share this psychic space in such a way that, I actually get to learn from the book that I'm reading of mm -hmm. whoever's there on the table. And I'm constantly, you know, learning and learning and learning what different codes and frequencies and ideas and energies and what things need to be healed or transmuted, where the body is storing things. And it informs me. So it's like I get to go to the great library of 
you know, everyone being who is a master in their own right on the mm -hmm. inside. And I get to read the book of a master and then I can always come out better from it. So mm. it's one of my favorite things to do. And the amount of magical things that have happened on that table is it's like, it, it's indescribable what I've, what I've experienced mm. in facilitating for some, you know, really remarkable people. Mm. And again, it is very, very different. Uh, for every individual mm -hmm. but that's the beauty of it because everybody's got a different book and a different chapter of the book I'm not even saying that I read the whole book <laughs> you know like yeah. we when we were there I was reading a lot about ISIS from you <laughs> a lot about ISIS and I'm pretty sure you almost levitated off the table at one point <laughs> yes. you became so light I was I felt like I was carrying an albatross or something what's was, an albatross that's a big bird <laughs> I mean, like, like that's what it was like. Wings yeah, just huge, huge <laughs> wings. And it was like, oh, wow. You're mm -hmm. like everything just lightened in the energy. And whether actually you were lighter or actually that's just the way it felt because of the energy. I mean, all right, we can have our debate about that. But in, it genuinely felt like you were about 14 pounds wow. when I was holding you on the table there. And and that was a, a, just a beautiful experience of you mm. stepping into that, stepping into that energetic resonance. And to my experience, changing the density and actually the weight of your entire body, mm. which may be an old forgotten lost technology, the ability mm. to change your resonance and then change your, change your density. Who knows? Mm. It's an interesting world. Well, I would say that certainly was an initiation for me. And then like sort of outing myself in this new realm of work on your podcast, the whole thing was quite quite its own initiation. Yeah. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, so last question before we, before we close is where do you think we're going as a species? And how do you think we can or perhaps, dare I say, should prepare now? We're coming to a point of resolution where actually all you know everything is going to actually meet all of the old ideas some of the challenging and detrimental ideas that have perpetuated you know through the origins of empire this desire to control to keep people you know restrict their access to their own personal power to their so sovereignty. that's how you define empire the desire to control right. and restrict access to people's own sovereignty correct okay yeah empire wants empire wants drones empire wants stormtroopers empire wants faceless defaced people who are who are slaves to the system that puts certain people in extreme power right like that's the idea of empire it's extraordinarily hierarchical in which all of these other people serve me the one it's it's the actual expansion of the detrimental aspect of the ego or the shadow aspect of the ego which wants to be better than everybody else and wants everybody to serve it if unchecked if disconnected from the field that's what the ego wants and empire is just that played out in the collective the desire to have certain people with extreme power and everybody else serving those different people as basically you know servants or mm. in you know in, in that in that capacity so there's that energy and there's all the ideas of that in order to perpetuate and exacerbate that energy you weave fear and you weave division and you restrict sexuality and you squash magic and you promote this version of materialist reductionist scientism that denies the existence of anything that's outside of the non-material and all of these different ways that we're disconnected from the full power of who we are so that played out through politics and, and the corporatocracy that we find ourselves in with the reemergence of people who are finding their true, true power and bringing back the old forgotten lineages, you know, all of the old wisdom lineages of Solomon that, you know, Rabbi Mark Gaffney's taking and piecing back together from the hidden allegorical references from the many books and bringing back that wisdom and then the Mahayana Buddhist wisdom that's coming in, the, the, the deep kind of Kashmir Shaivism and all every, I mean, you can name something from the Gnostic Christianity to every different aspect. It's all coming in as well as the best in modern philosophy and psychology practices like internal family systems, all of these different things. And the medicines are coming on board now. And so there's this huge point where structures that have been built on an old story 
are now coming to face with the truth about life itself and the truth about who we are. And I, it's hard to see that being smooth, but <laughs> that's a, it's a prayer we can hold. I'm, I'm praying for it. The revolution that does not require a revolt. Yeah. That we just birth it through our own pleasure that we can hold the frequency of this new earth yeah. and that we can manifest it even in the wake of the crumbling of the old unsustainable and I think we can individually and like we have the ability with how we see things to see that this is happening and this is necessary for this to happen and all compassion to those that are hurt when this happens. You know, it's like if the, the recently this last week, one of the banks failed, Silicon Valley Bank failed. And it's like, you know, damn. You know, like, that, but obviously this is systemic of a bigger problem that needs to be there. But it's not like you don't have compassion for people who had their life savings in their bank and they can't get it back. And for whatever reason, it wasn't FDIC and they may not ever get their money back. It's like, and you lost a lot of compassion. money, right? Yeah. So I didn't have direct exposure with my, but so many of my investments banked for them because they're mm -hmm. like venture capital. So all of a sudden, a huge portion of my wealth is now at risk. I actually don't even know. I mean, today's Monday, so presumably I'll find out more. But <laughs> it could have evaporated, like a huge amount could have evaporated. So for me, I could have gone into the scarcity, fear, you know, I can't believe this happened, blah, blah, blah. Or I could choose to just see this like, well, this was the crumbling of a building that I, you know, had some trinkets stored in mm -hmm. and the trinkets may be smashed and I may never get them back. And that's okay. These mm -hmm. different buildings will crumble and I have, you know, different resources spread in different places and it won't all come. And, and if it does, I'm going to be fine. Cause guess what? I got me and Vailana and me and Vailana can live on my parents' fucking couch and still have a great time. Yeah. I mean, we might need a private bedroom for all everything that we do, <laughs> be but more, more, more comfortable, <laughs> less awkward for all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that, I mean, this idea that no, no, it's going to work out. It's like, we're going to be okay one way or another. And even if something catastrophic individually happens, it's like, all right, well, you know, in this incarnation, this is all that I was able to get out of it, but I'm going to get another, sh I'm going to get another shot at this. And that would be a great tragedy, but there's still a way to see that kill keeps you engaged with life and seeing the more beautiful world in process, even if things are crumbling. So while I don't think it's going to be necessarily smooth across the board, I think for every individual who has this type of mindset, it will smooth your purview, your window into the multiverse to a degree that you're going to be able to actually stay above the ruckus and the chaos that yeah. may come. Yeah, they keep our attention on the creation that happens right Correct. behind the destruction. Correct. Yeah. Wow. Well, Aubrey, you are, I mean, I would sit here for eight more hours, but it would get, get very hot in here. <laughs> yeah, it is warm. Um, but thank you for your lifetime of devotion. Thank you for your lifetime of study. Thank you for your outrageous generosity in lifting up the people that you see birthing this more beautiful earth that we all know is possible. Thank you for your time here today. And I'm so excited that you are going to give us a window into what sounds like a really powerful exercise, a way for us to change our future by changing our past. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited about that. And I want to say thank you so much for joining us on this ride. As you can tell, this is a very brilliant, um, mission driven human um where would you like to direct people where would you like for people to come and find you Aside. Aubrey Marcus podcast yeah it's and really really good <laughs> thanks, it's sis. so good thanks sis and just yeah at Aubrey Marcus on Instagram it's my most active social platform okay so Aubrey Marcus on Instagram and the Aubrey Marcus podcast truly I mean he's covering everything everything from the science of magic all manner of psychedelics um, political divide and creating unity inside of it um, lifting up authors and philosophers from all different lineages it's really um, it's a gift it's a very generous gift that you're giving to the world every week. It's my honor. Yeah, well, thank you so much for joining us. If you are enjoying this, I would be so grateful if you would follow and do stick around. Join us at zivameditation.com slash why this, where you're going to get to enjoy these bonus teachings that we simply cannot fit inside of the podcast, where you're going to get to dive deeper and get to actually experience some of these modalities that we've been speaking of. So thank you so, so much. I love you and I will see you next week. <laughs>